Hello, everyone. I hope you are fine. This is much better. Hello, everyone. I hope you are uh, fine. Marketing and media research. Um, it has been so long since I last saw you. Uh, my apology for last week. I didn't uh, send a lecture. I was having some problem with my eyes. That's why I'm wearing my big eyeglasses. Um, uh, as you all know, we have uh, delayed the presentation of your assignment till um, 20, 20, 20 of, uh, of April. Oh, yes, 20 of April. Um, and uh, happy spring break. <laughs> Uh, I hope you are all uh, safe. Today we are going uh, to talk regarding our uh, lecture. Today we are going to talk about the quantitative uh, method, the survey. Uh, most of you, when you send me um, your assignment or your project in order for me to review it, most of you are just uh, like at the end of your um, project, uh, when, you are, when you are putting your uh, questions regarding the survey, I all of you told you, uh, just bear with me until I finish the explanation of how to order your question, which type of question should come at the first, which type of question should come uh, at the end, and what types of different question we should depend on. Today we are going to talk about uh, all of these uh, topics, so this lecture maybe, I hope not, but maybe it will be a little bit longer than we are used to do, but uh, uh, I hope it's going to be a little bit uh, interesting. Okay, so uh, let's begin by uh, our lecture last time. Uh, we uh, stopped on the sensitive information. We were talking about uh, things related to uh, the survey, about the survey design process. We were talking about what kind of information is needed, what type of interview you are going to depend on. We have already finished the, the, the points regarding determining the content of the individual questions and how to overcome the inability or the unwillingness to answer the question. The last thing we were talking about was related to the sensitive information. If the respondent are unwilling to disclose or to tell you uh, information that from his or her own point of view is considered sensitive, the last thing we were talking about, we didn't start, we are going to speak about it today, it's about what are the techniques we can use in order to get the information we needed, especially if this information is considered sensitive. The first thing that all the topics related to the sensitive, uh, like, uh, by the way, age, income, uh, marital status, especially for, for women, um, anything related to uh, money, anyway, this is for, for a lot of respondents, especially in our society, in the Egyptian society, it's considered sensitive topics. So we recommend that all the sensitive topics should be placed at the end of the questions. Why? Here's the answer why. Because if we put it at the first, there is no a kind of trust, there is no kind of confidence between you and the respondent, between you, between the researcher and the people who do the survey. Um, so you have to ask them like an opening question. This is how to order your question. Begin by opening questions, general questions, that uh, don't make him feel uneasy or don't make him feel that he is like, uh, you're asking him about so sensitive question. Then in the middle, begin to ask him about real information regarding your topics. Then at the end, place all the sensitive information. Why? Because by then, the initial mistrust or the feeling of the inconfidence between you and the respondent will be overcome. Uh, the legitimacy of the project has been established during the different question that you have already asked. And that's why at the beginning of any survey, the first thing we should always put it, it's like a paragraph. This paragraph, it is giving an introduction to the respondent, telling him who you are, what are you doing, why you are collecting the information, and you have to focus on one of the most important sentence, its meaning, I'm not here talking about uh, precisely what we write in it, but its meaning that all of this information we gather it for scientific purpose and nothing more. And be sure that this information is classified and it's not going to be used in anything rather than scientific purposes. This is like um, a copy and paste question uh, sorry, a sentence that should be always at the first of your um, um, survey, at the introduction, after telling who you are and uh, what's the purpose of your uh, of your survey and why you are collecting information, you have to give him like some kind of trust, some kind of confidence 
be assured that all the information I'm already collecting from you, it's for a scientific purpose, it's not for any other reasons. So all the uh, sensitive questions or the question that you feel as a researcher that you can be a little bit sensitive for your respondent, try to put it at the end of your researcher after you have gained the confidence of the respondent. Another technique that even when you put the question, if it's not like a demographic question, but uh, any other question, try to preface it or try to rephrase it as if it is a behavior, as if it is a sentence, like the example I've already put it in the slides. Recent studies shows that most Americans are in depth and as if I'm giving him like a justification, don't worry, you are just one of all the Americans that are facing such kind of problems. Most of the, uh, of the Egyptian people are, um, uh, are facing a health problem, uh, psychological problems, uh, some problems related to depression. So when I just begin my statement by that, I'm giving him like a kind of assurance, don't worry, you are just one of the millions. Because actually, uh, as a human beings that we feel that we are a part of a larger group, this is actually, it's kind of comfort for us. So as a way of trying to uh, get information regarding sensitive uh, 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 information, try to begin your, your, your question by statement that give uh, the respondent the assurance on one of the many. It's not your only problem. Another thing or another way in order to get um, a sensitive information, it is to ask it in the third person techniques. I think we talked about the third person techniques before, but the third person techniques is as if I'm asking the respondent to give me an answer as if he's talking about someone else. This is actually a little bit psychological techniques, meaning what? Sometimes when you ask uh, the respondent directly in his face, uh, tell me about one, two, three, four, maybe he will feel shy, maybe he will feel ashamed a little bit. But if you ask him as if you are asking about his friend, third person, like for example, uh, if your friend faced such kind of situation, what he's going to do? The, like when we were talking about the projective techniques, asking in the third person, actually we can take the same techniques which we talked about it. Um, before in the projective techniques and just uh, like rephrase our question inside the survey by the third person to give him again a kind of insurance I'm talking about another person and I'm going to be sure that his answer is actually he's projecting his own feelings his own answer on this person and he won't feel like shame or shy or afraid to tell his to tell uh, uh, his answer because he's going to be like I am um, psychologically uh, i'm not asking about him i'm asking about uh, another one but actually he's projecting his feelings his answers on this person okay uh, another thing it's actually about categorization or categories if you are asking about uh, income if you are asking about age you can see that in most of the cases we never like in rare cases we never ask a lady please tell me your age what's your age and I just give it in an open question. Why? Because actually for a lot, for every woman, by the way, it's, 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 it's not a question. They are not going to answer or they are going to give you a lot. So in this case, give them a kind of categories. These categories like have 10 years or six years or seven years, each category about seven years. So you are just like um, putting the people inside a categories but not asking them about their specific age. Like, for example, from 25 to 35, from 35 to uh, 45, for example, maybe she's a 44, but actually when she answered, she will feel a little bit light. Uh, if you tell her from 35 to 45, even if she is 44, because for her psychologically, uh, she is still in this range of uh, late 30s, early 40s, something like that. So this is different techniques in order to get answers regarding sensitive information that the people might be unwilling to give it to you uh, freely or without any kind of, of, of concern. Okay, uh, this is, was actually the last thing that we should end it last time, but we, I couldn't have the time to end it by this part, but this is the last part. Today we are going to talk about the structure of the questions. By the structure here of the question, actually I'm talking about the different types of the question. What are the different types of the question 
that can be uh, added or put inside a questionnaire or inside a survey. Actually, we have two types, two big types of questions. The first type, it's called the unstructured questions. And it, why it is called unstructured question? Actually, because the answer itself, it's unstructured. And we have the structured question. The structured questions, actually, it refers that the option or the answer of this question is limited to some type of alternatives or options available. So actually, when we are talking about question structure, we are talking about what type of question should be included inside your questionnaire. We have two types. We have structured questions. By structured questions, I mean, I, as a researcher, already give the respondent different options, different alternatives to choose from within. But the unstructured, it's like the open question, I'm actually not giving the uh, respondent uh, an answer. I'm just telling him to write as much as he can from his own point of view. So let's talk about the first one, which is the unstructured question. The unstructured question, it is the open-ended question. The open-ended question, it's an open question that I ask the respondent, me as a researcher, to answer in his own words, how he feels. Like, what's your occupation? Uh, what's your favorite singer? Uh, how do you like your, uh, your coffee, for example? Um, why? This type of question that actually it enabled the respondent, it's, it's advantage. Here I'm talking about the advantage of the open-ended question. The open question, it, it actually, it's one of its major benefits that it gives the respondent the freedom and the choice to express the general response rather than a structured question. It gives them the freedom to write whatever they would like about their attitudes, about their opinion, about their views, about their values, without limiting them with a specific answers or with specific questions. Another uh, advantage related to the open question that it is less, less biasing influence. By, by biasing influence, I mean here what? Um, here, I'm not trying to um, take my respondent to a specific area or to a specific place or to a specific answers. Uh, as if, if I am telling you, why do you like that, for example? And I'm just giving you few options. Maybe, maybe you have another thing. Okay, and especially if I didn't add others, I'm just giving you like three answers. But actually, none of these three answers express how you are feeling. So regarding the open-ended questions, it has two benefits. It's, it's give, it gives the, um, the respondent the freedom, the total freedom to express whatever he would like in his own words. The second thing, it is less biased. By, by bias here, I mean I don't influence the respondent answers. I just give him the freedom. But on the other hand, the disadvantage of it, that the coding, what I mean by the coding, I mean how to translate these uh, answers into uh, specific things, meanings what? When I'm asking the respondent to tell me why he liked this movie, for example, everyone is going to write it in his own words. But actually, me as a researcher, in order to make common sense, in order to understand this type of answers, I have to put them into categories, which, uh, um, again, which will need from me an extra effort. I should be very uh, experienced. I should, uh, uh, I should be like um, uh, really um, very good at analyzing the information in order to make sense of this information that you provided. Let's say it in Arabic in order to make it a little bit more simpler. When we say that we have a question open, the question is open has a meaning. What is it? You like this? Why? Why do you like this? The question is open gives the respondent the ability to answer in the way that he wants, without anyone else telling him what to do. And you don't have to worry about the answer. But the problem is in the process of thinking or the process of getting out of it. You always need to be aware that he is very smart. ومثقف وعنده علم قوي بالموضوع ليه؟ عشان يعرف يحول الاجابات بقى المتشعبه دي في مليون حته يحاول يحولها لكاتيجوريز اتفاقات يعني مثلا اصل انا بحب اصل انا حبيت الفيلم ده ليه؟ عشان بحب الممثل عشان انا مش عارفه بحب المخرج عشان القصه بتاعت الفيلم عشان كذا عشان كذا عشان كذا الفكره بقى في ايه؟ 
اللي بيحلل بيبتدي ياخد من الاجابات دي ويبتدي يحولها لكاتيجوريز ويضم الحاجات اللي شبه بعض مع بعض عشان يجي يقول لا الناس كانت معظمها بتحبها عشان هي بتحب الممثل ده يبقى هو ده نقطه القوه اللي فيها انت ليه بتحب مثلا ستاربكس ما بتحبش مثلا سلاب فور اكزامبل او اسبريسو لا انذر اكزامبل فحد من غير بقى ما تيجي تقول له حد يجي يقول لك اصل نوع القهوه حد يجي يقول لك اصل طريقه المعامله حد يقول لك اصل الانتشار الجغرافي حد يقول لك عشان كذا ماشي في الجزء بتاع الانتشار الجغرافي دي كلمه انتشار جغرافي انا از ريسيرشر انا اللي حطيت الكلمه دي من دماغي ليه؟ لان هو في حد قال لك اصل هو الاقرب ليه؟ اصل انا لما بروح في اي حته دايما بلاقيه اصل هو منتشر قوي الثلاثه دول معناهم ايه؟ معناهم ان الانتشار الجغرافي بتاعه المحلات دي افضل من المحلات دي اللي خلاني احط كل الكلام ده في الكاتيجوري دي ده باحث شاطر عن باحث تاني اوكي؟ يبقى دي المزايا والعيوب بتاعه الانستراكشرد كويشن But for your own information, we always recommend our researcher in their master or in their PhD or even in the market research, try as much as you can not to use the unstructured questions for many reasons. Well, first, the respondent don't have the time or the effort to write a lot of the information. So most of the time they are going to skip it. But the second thing, as I told you, that the coding and the analyzing of this information requires a lot of effort and a lot of time and maybe a lot of money because I need someone uh, experience in order to analyze this information to give me a, some kind of meaning. So that's why we don't recommend using this kind of question except in the limited cases. The other type of the question that are actually none and one of the most used uh, questions in the questionnaire is, is the structured question. As I told you before, the structured question, why we call them structured, as I, as I mentioned in the slide, because actually this type of question, they specify a set of responses alternatives, a set of options, a set of uh, choices available for the respondent to choose one of them. We have three types inside the structured question. Either it is multiple choice or dichotomous or scale. Let's talk about the first thing, multiple choice. I think we all know what we mean by multiple choice. The multiple choice, it's a question that the researcher provide the respondent with a choice of the answers and the respondent are going to select one or more. This is according to what, according to what the researcher wants. Like sometimes the researcher is going to tell you between two brackets, just choose one answer or uh, the researcher will tell the respondent you can you can uh, choose more than one like do you intend to buy a new car within this next six years i have like six different options you can choose whatever you would like uh, which type of uh, of uh, coffee shop would you like uh, starbucks uh, espresso lab uh, venus uh, cilantro uh, whatever or others and I'm going to tell you, please choose one of these, uh, choose one, only one brand. Or I can tell you, please choose uh, which brands do you like. Okay, so the multiple choice, it's a type of question that I give a question for the respondent and I give him different alternatives and I'm going to give him like an instruction. Either choose one of them or more than one uh, answer. This is the multiple choice. On the other side, we have what we call the dichotomous. Dichotomous means what? That it is a question, but only with two choices. Yes or no, male, male or female. Uh, and, and probably it is the type of the question that is related to yes or no. Are you going to buy Kaza? Do you like Kaza? Yani, uh, do you watch TV? It's yes or no. There is no any other option. Do you, uh, do you have a um, like Twitter account? Like some questions related to Twitter, for example. So I'm going to ask the first, the first opening question. Do you have a Twitter account? Yes or no? Either yes or no, it's not. Then after that, if yes, I'm going to ask him further question. If no, okay, you are not one of the uh, respondent I want to ask you. So the dichotomous question, the difference between it and the multiple choice, that it is the type of the question that just have two uh, responses, two answer alternative, two choices only, yes or no. Like the question of male or female, uh, male or female. As far as I know, there's no uh, another one, male or female, okay? This is regarding the dichotomous question. What about the scale? The scale, it is actually one of the used, uh, or, or one of the most used type of question. It is uh, on its structured questions, but it is different from the multiple choice and the dichotomous. Why? Because it's like assigning a value, assigning uh, a number for each uh, answer. And this number give me, um, 
a need. It's a procedure of measuring. It's a procedure of assigning the objectives, the, ob the objects to a number. Meaning what? Well. Scale is like when you uh, like uh, know your um, weight. You go on the scale to measure your weight. For example, you are like uh, 160, for example, 160 centimeters, and your uh, weight is like this is a scale. So you weight. Your scale is like uh, 60, 60 kilos. Okay, so this is have a meanings inside my head that 60 kilo means that you are perfect. A 50 kilo, uh, it's more than perfect. It's 40 kilo, you are underweight. A 90 kilo, you are overweight. So here, what we mean by skill, skill is a procedure of measuring. It's a procedure of measuring something. Only, no. It's about also after measuring, assigning a number for, uh, for something. This number is going to have a meaning for me. We have four types of scales. We have four scale of measurements. We have four types. Either nominal, and this is how we classify our data. Either nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio. Actually, we are going to focus on the first three. Nominal, ordinal, interval. In Arab, scale معناه ايه جماعة? Scale معناه مقياس. في أسئلة كتيرة بتبقى موجودة إحنا بنشوفها في السيرفيز. لو أنتم بتعملوا السيرفيز كتير أو بتجاوبوا على السيرفيز بتلاقوا في أسئلة انتوا ما بتبقوش عارفين ده سكيل بس اكشلي ده سكيل. الفكره في السكيل ايه؟ لا هو ديكوتومس ولا هو مالتي بتشوكس. السكيل دي وسيله للقياس. بنقيس بيها ايه؟ بن بندي قيمه لحاجه معينه، القيمه دي احنا بنفهم معناها ايه؟ زي ما بقول لكم. دلوقتي واحد قاس وزنه وهو طوله 160 سم، لقى وزنه 40 50 60 80 90 الرقم لوحده ملوش معنى بس الرقم احنا بنديله تفسير عن طريق ان ده ميزان ان عارفين ان ال 40 دي معناها ان هو وزنه انه اقل من الوزن العادي 90 معناها ان هو اوفر ويت يبقى دي التفسير اللي انا بديله This is what we mean by scale وعندنا اربع اشكال من السكيلز بنقيس اربع حاجات يا اما nominal nominal من اسمها جايه من كلمه names it's related to names هل names ممكن تتقاس actually we are going to see how or ordinal ordinal اللي هم ترتيبي يعني ترتيب الحاجات او interval يعني في ايه خلينا نشوف كل واحده معناها ايه the first one the nominal scale the nominal scale ده بما انه اسم يبقى the numbers here does it serve uh, بتديني معنى معين actually here no the numbers here are only used as a label or tags for identifying or classifying objects يعني ايه name or tags for identifying or classifying objects For example, I'm going to ask, uh, uh, kindly uh, state your gender, male or female. Then when I'm analyzing the data, I'm going to say the male is going to take number one, the female is going to take number two, for example. So actually number one, it is just uh, like, uh, it means a male, but I can put like two or three or four or five in front of the male. So here the number, it's only a label for the object. It's a way of classifying the object. Like for example, name the brands of tea. Lipton, Ahmed tea, Al Arusa, uh, uh, tea for you, uh, uh, Twinks, Masala. Banandi Hamas Hage. Bana Hage U Lipton Hakud Rakam Wahi. آه العروس هياخد رقم اثنين آه مش عارفه توينكس هياخد رقم ثلاثه آه احمد تي هياخد رقم اربعه يبقى هنا الارقام لوحدها هي ملهاش معنى هو الرقم مرادف للاسم اللي انا حطيته جنبه اوكي يبقى بنقول هنا ان ذا ماركت ريسيرش وي يوزولي يوز النومينال سكيل فور ايدنتيفاينج الريسبوندنس يعني ميل او فيميل ذا براندز اور ذا برودكتس مثلا والclassification هنا أنا بستخدمها to classify يبقى for gender classification I'm going to classify male as group 1 and the female as group 2 يبقى nominal scale the numbers here serve as what it serve only as a labels or scales for identifying or classifying objects this is the first primary scale of measurement okay as we see here what's your hair color Number one is brown, number two is black. I can change the numbers because the numbers doesn't mean anything. It is just a label. It is just a label for what's yeah, for what's next to it. Okay? So this is the nominal scale. What about the ordinal scale? 
the ordinal comes from the order of something, the organizing of the something. This is, is a ranking scheme. يعني إيه ranking scheme؟ يعني here the number doesn't give me an um, like give me a, a credit information. Actually, the order is the thing that give me a value. The order it's what's significant. And here actually I cannot put one before one. يعني something before the other. Like for example, how do you feel today? Very unhappy, then unhappy, then okay. I cannot put okay, then unhappy, then very unhappy. Why? Because this is the order of the things. أنا متضايقة أوي. أنا متضايقة. أنا كويسة. أنا فرحانة. أنا فرحانة أوي. ما ينفعش أجي أقول أصل أنا فرحانة وأنا فرحانة أوي. يبقى دي الـ ordinal it's about the order of the things. The order of the scales. The order of uh, like emotion. How are you satisfied? Very satisfied, satisfied, uh, unsatisfied, some, some, some way unsatisfied, neutral. But yeah, very unsatisfied. Yeah, man, man, first have to neutral. I'm very unsatisfied. The number one thing that I'm going to do is okay. So when we're on the ordinal, it is the ranking of the scales. It is the order of the things. It is the order of the value. It is what's important and what's significant. See, here now, the order it 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 reflects what's significant, what's more important, and what's not uh, important. The ordinary scales are typically a measurement of the non-numeric values. يعني إيه non-numeric concepts. يعني حاجة ما فش حط لها رقم ما فش اسم الرقم. يعني الوزن مثلاً أنا أقدر أقيسه. أقدر أقول إن أربعين هو أكبر من خمسين، ده ليه رقم، لكن السعادة ما أقدرش أحط لها رقم، أوكي؟ أنا مش هقدر يعني هنا الكونسيبت ده ما أقدرش أحوله لرقم، ده الـ ordinary scale، يبقى الـ ordinary scale it is a ranking scale in which the order of the values it's it's what's important. This is regarding the ordinary scale. What about the interval scale? The interval scale is a numeric scale، يعني إيه numeric scale؟ يعني زي ما نقول بقى ده العكس. قلنا عندنا واحد the numbers, I don't care about it. Why? Because the numbers, it is related. It's like a label. It's a label for the objective. This is the first part, the nominal. The ordinal, what I care about, it is the order of the things, the order of the concept. But I cannot understand what is the difference between very unhappy and unhappy. Because I cannot measure this part. Because the concept in the ordinal, I cannot measure it in terms of number. On the other side, the interval, it's a, num a numeric scale. It's a numeric. It's a numeric. It's, it's related to number. I actually can see the order of the things. This is why, in this case, not only tell me about the order of the things, but actually I give a value for each item. يعني هنا مثلا زي ما احنا شايفين مثلا عندنا أكتر من حالة من أول number one Two, three, four, لغاية number ten. وشايفين إن the scale عندنا بي إيه بيزيد عندي. ده اسمه net promoter score. The net promoter score ده معناه إيه? It refers مثلاً the company عايزة تشوف to what extent the customer is happy or not happy with the product, with the customer, with the company, with the service. فبحولها the scale. بحولها the scale في شكل أرقام. هنا عندي intervals. هنا عندي فئات. رقم واحد لازم هيكون اقل من رقم اثنين، رقم اثنين لازم هيكون اقل من رقم ثلاثة، رقم عشرة لازم هيكون أكبر من رقم واحد، ملهاش أوبشن تاني. يبقى بنقول عندنا السكيلز اتس أ واي أوف ميجرينج ذا ثينجز أند أساينينج أ نمبر فور إيتش ون أوف ذيم. وي هاف ثري تايب، وي هاف أكشلي فور تايبس أوف أوف سكيلز. ذا فيرست ون اتس أباوت ذا نومينال. النومينال معناه إيه؟ ذات أي كان تشينج سمثينج ريتن إن تيرمز أوف نيمز إنتو أ نمبرز. But here the number doesn't give me a significance. It doesn't mean anything for me except that it is a label for the object. This is regarding what? This is regarding the novel. The second part, it's about the ordinary. The ordinary, it's about the order of the things. So what I care about regarding the ordinary, it's about the order of the things. So here, the numbers, it's just putting the order of the things. I cannot put something before another one. But actually, I cannot find the, the, the I cannot measure the difference between each value and the other one. The last one, it is the interval. The interval here, it's a numeric scale. It gives me actually the two things. As you can see, each scale is like overcoming uh, the disadvantage of the scale before. So the nominal, it is the weakest one because the number doesn't have a meaning. 
then the, the ordinal, it's a little bit stronger than it because it gives me the order of the things, but I cannot see, but it's not still numeric because I cannot see the value between each one and the other, each value on the other. And the last one, the interval, actually, it's getting more, um, more, more powerful. Why? Because actually, it gives me the order, so each one is going to have the benefit of the one before it. يعني كل واحد هاخد الميزة بتاعت اللي قبلي. فالأول واحد كان بيقول لي أسماء. تاني واحد قال لك ترتيب. تالت واحد قال لك فئات. الفئات دي فيها إيه؟ فيها الترتيب، الترتيب موجود وكمان أنا بقيت عندي الفاليو موجودة ما بين كل واحد وثاني. ما بين واحد واثنين هي فرق واحد، ما بين اثنين وثلاثة هي فرق واحد، يبقى أنا عارفة إيه الفرق ما بين كل واحد والتاني، أوكي؟ وفي نفس الوقت أنا عندي الترتيب بتاعهم. طب وات داز إت ميس؟ إت ميس ذا زيرو. أنا ما عنديش هنا فئة الزيرو. هو أول حاجة واحد، آخر حاجة 10. ما فيش فئة هنا بقى إيه؟ النيوترال. فئة النيوترال ما بتبقاش موجودة هنا. يبقى عندي الانترفل، it's a kind of numeric scale in which I know the exact difference between the values and I know the order of it. But what does it miss? It miss the true zero. I don't have the true zero. Okay? This is the scale type. How can I use the scales inside بقى inside a inside my survey? يعني إحنا عارفين إزاي نعمل أسئلة الأنستركتشر. هنسأل سؤال مفتوح. عارفين ازاي نعمل الاسئله اللي هي سواء المالتيبل تشويس او الديكوتومس احنا عارفين نسالها ازاي هاو بقى افتر اي نو وات وي مين باي سكيلز اند واتس ذا ديفرنس بتوين ذا ديفرنت تايبس اوف ميجرمنت ريجاردينج ذا سكيلز هاو كان اي يوز ذا سكيل انسايد ماي سيرفي اكشلي ام جوينج تو تيل يو لايك تو اوف ذا موست فيموس سكيلز ذات اكشلي اتس يوز Uh, it's used inside what? Inside a mass communication studies or the communication studies and the marketing studies, of course. The first one, it's called Likert. Likert, it's a scale. Actually, this scale, what does it measure? It measures your attitude. Likert, it's a scale. مقياس بيقيس اتجاهك ناحية الشيء ايه. بتحبه ولا بتكرهه. Okay, so it's a scale that required the respondent to indicate a degree of agreement or disagreement with each of serious statement. Typically, each scale have a statement. If I'm the scale, the scale is a different statement. I have it. Then I'm going to ask you: strongly agree, disagree, neutral, you agree, or you totally agree, or strongly agree. So I'm going the Likert scale. How can we make it? We put statements. Gomal, the gomal di actually it reflect what each sentence reflect the attitude of the respondent toward the product. Like for example, masala. The people who are working on mapping the food industry. So we talk, for example, about their attitudes toward, for example, their attitudes toward the supermarket. I like to go to the supermarket to buy the food. أنا مثلا بفضل البقالين عشان أشتري الأكل بتاعي. أنا مثلا بالنسبة لي ماركة النسكافيه بتبقى أحسن من ماركة كذا في الماركة ال بحب أشتري القهوة دايما من مثلا الكوفي شوبس مش من البقال أو مش من السوبر ماركت. أنا بحب أروح الهايبر ماركت الكبير عشان بعرف أشتري منه الحاجات اللي أنا عايزاها. اوكي أه بشتري دايما من الهايبر ماركتس بالاسبوع لكن ما بشتريهاش اون ديلي بيزس لما بحب اشتري اون ديلي بيزس بشتري في السوبر ماركت. This is the type of the statement that you can use in the Likert scale. So regarding Likert scale you can use a statement statement full statements عندنا regarding your uh, topic and the respondent is going to say to what extent he agree or disagree with each statement of these statements. Okay, we been all it is a five response category. The five response categories. Then I have strongly disagree, agree, disagree, neutral, agree, strongly agree. You have all those moments. Five categories of the answers. Five categories of the question of the responses. You have the respondent should. Here, about the question, the the respondent should choose just one category regarding each statement. My infashaga all strongly agree or strongly disagree. Ma ya agree, ya disagree, ya neutral. It's far amai. If I'm in only each statement, the respondent is going to choose one of these categories to ask about. So one of the most or or the used scales, it's Likert. Likert. It's about the attitudes. It's a measurement of the attitudes. How can we make this scale? It's about putting different. 
statement. Here, I'm just giving you like a quick view about Likert. Here, I'm not talking about how to, to actually write Likert because actually how to write each statement inside Likert, this is like another, uh, it can be in another lecture. For example, how to write each statement, but unfortunately we don't have the time or we don't have like the means in order to give you like precise way how to write each uh, statement regarding uh, liquid but i can send you but i don't i don't think that you would care about that but i will do my my best i'm going to send you some um, uh, like uh, references about how to write the uh, the statement in liquid scale for who is concerned or who, for who we care okay but all you need to know about liquid that liquid it's one of the scales that can be used inside the marketing research in order to measure the attitudes it's actually trying to measure the degree of agreement or disagreement the respondent uh, reflect toward each statement you put it. And this statement, it's about a choice of one of five categories. It begins by strongly disagree, then disagree, then neutral, then agree, then strongly uh, agree. This is regarding like Another example, it's about semantic differentiation scale. Semantic differentiation scale, actually, it's about seven points. So, Likert, five points. Um, semantic differentiation, it's about seven points. These seven points, in this part, I can ask you about comparison between Likert and the semantic differentiation. One, it's about five points. The other, it's about seven points. One is about statement, full statement, and the respondent is going to choose one of the five categories. Actually, here it's about objectives, opposing objectives. Let's see the example here. Like, please brand X choose. Brand X D. Charles and Keith, for example. Explain how you feel about Charles and Keith. For example, uh, modern, outdated, stylish, unfashionable, sexy, crumby. So actually, in the semantic differentiation, it's not about measuring attitudes, it's about different objectives. Semantic differentiation, I'm actually, it's a scale of seven rating points. Here I have a not a neutral bit of a mousse. هتلاقوا ان في عندنا في النص ثلاثة قبليه وايجابي بيميلوا ناحيه الصفه الايجابيه وثلاثه بيميلوا ناحيه الصفه السلبيه. On the other end we have opposing adjectives or statement. Each respondent select a point on the scale indicating which side of the scale best reflect their opinion and the degree to which they feel about it. The semantic differentiation are frequently used also Two things, to measure attitudes and perception of the activities and the brand. So sometimes you can use it to attitude, but mostly we use liquid for the attitudes. And here, the smutting differentiation, it's about perception. Perception of the things. Okay, so actually this is was our lecture for uh, today uh, so uh, regarding this lecture what we talked about we actually talked about uh, different things first of all we talked about the different techniques we can use it in order to overcome the unwillingness or the sensitive uh, to require sensitive information from our uh, respondent then after that we talked about the, uh, the structure of the question or the different types of the question that we can use inside our survey. We talked about the unstructured and the structured. The first one, the unstructured, was related to the open-ended questions. We talked about what are the benefits and what are the, uh, the disadvantage of the open-ended the open -ended question and why we don't recommend to use it very much because the respondent don't have time and effort to write a lot of information regarding your uh, question. Then we talked about the different structured, uh, unstructured, uh, sorry, structured question. We talked about the multiple choice. It's a question with different alternatives that, uh, that uh, the respondent either is going to choose one or more than one. Then we talked about the dichotomous. The dichotomous actually, it's about two response alternatives. You have to choose either one or the, yeah, this one or this one. Then we talked about what we mean by scale and the four scales of um, measurement. We talked about the nominal and we talked about the ordinal, and then we talked about the interval. Then we talked about one, uh, the two, like the most famous uh, scales that it's actually used inside uh, the marketing research and actually in the mass communication, 
liquor that it is related to the attitude, it's a measurement and it's a five point scale. Then we talked about the semantic differentiation, which on the other side is seven point scales and it's regarding the perception of the respondent toward activities or uh, brands. Um, to this uh, part, actually, we are going to be able to do the quantitative and qualitative uh, methods, which is the difficulty survey, will question how to get information. After that, like next lectures, we are going to talk about different marketing research. Like, I'm giving you the basics of uh, marketing research, what kind of questions, what type of uh, techniques, what type of tools we are going to use to collect information regarding different objectives. Then after that, we are going to talk in each lecture, the, like the next lecture, about specific type of research, specific type of uh, techniques related to uh, different uh, topics. I hope this lecture is, um, is understood uh, from your uh, point of view. Uh, again, if you have any question, you are more than welcome to uh, ask me via email or just send your question to uh, Dr. Sora and she's going to tell me. Or if you need um, a live uh, Zoom meeting, um, we can uh, conduct a Zoom meeting uh, live. I actually conducted like three or four meetings with different groups uh, in the project. So if you have any questions, um, either this or that, uh, choose whatever you would like and just uh, let me know. Thank you so uh, much and hope to see you um, uh, next week, like next Tuesday actually, because we have like uh, the spring break. So happy uh, spring breaks for uh, all of you and stay safe and stay in. Thank you so much and see you soon, inshallah. Bye bye.